Well, yeah. Okay, so hi, my name is Ronald. I'm an Apple Helper developer, and um, I'm going to give a talk about um, VP9. And so, specifically, what I want to cover is VP9 encoding performance. And when I say performance, I mean quality as well as speed. So I'm going to first talk a little bit about encoding, right? So how do I actually create VP9 files and how well does that work? And how does that compare to all of these other awesome codecs that people have written several years ago, like, you know, HEPC, right? So this is like stuff that exists, not Tor or Dalam or VP10 or whatever. And then after that, we're going to talk about decoding performance. And that basically covers mostly uh, FFVP9, right? That's a decoder that Clement and I wrote um, like a year or two ago. And so you can see how awesome the performance of that decoder is. I apologize for that. Okay. Okay, so um, I want to start by just talking about a little bit about encoding. So um, I'm just going to get right down to it. So what did I do? I took a two-minute clip of uh, this movie called Tears of Steel. Why did I take this movie? Well, because I can freely download it, and it's open source and free, and that's all great. And it's actually a good movie for, for video encoder testing. A lot of people use it for this purpose, so it's good. So it's a two-minute clip, and then we encoded that with three encoders, right, with X264, which is supposed to be this amazing H264 encoder. We all love it, right? Yes, good. Then X265 and the VPX to create, you know, the VP9 file. So you can see the command lines here. What's in orange is the variable that I'm changing, right? So I'm going to try various values for it, and then the metric that I'm looking at, because I need some objective metric, I'm not going to look at 5,000 files here, is bitrate over SIM, right? Now, We've all seen those papers, we've all heard those claims, right? It's 50% better. Okay, so how does this work? So on the horizontal axis, you have bit rates. On the vertical axis, you have quality, as sim in this case, right? Both are logarithmic. So what, you, what you're looking at is the blue curve being the X264 graph, is if I take any of these points and I draw a horizontal line, to go from the green to the blue line, you will see that the blue line is more to, to the right. What that means is to accomplish the same quality, I need a higher bit rate. How much more bit rate? Well, for example, 30% more bit rates. What we're saying then is that the green point is 30% better than the interpolated point on the, X to, on, the, on the blue line. So green at this point is 30% better than this, right? So it's not actually 30% at that point, it's actually 50%. Um, and over here, the difference gets smaller at the high bitrate end. At the low bitrate end, you see that the difference is actually even bigger. It's much more than 50%. Overall, the average of this curve for this particular clip, for these two minutes, it happens to actually be around 50%. Yay, that's great. That's his advertised. Yes? Good. Okay. So um, that was the comparison of these two codecs versus X264. Now, let's actually compare X265 versus VP9, because that's an interesting question, right? Over at the high end, in this particular clip, VP9 actually outperforms X265. Um, I found that interesting, right? I didn't necessarily expect that, but that's good. So as, as Timothy said, right, so there's a range where YouTube is interested in those kind of bit rates, which is like around here-ish, maybe a little bit here-ish. Then there's like the WebRTC style bit rates, right? So at this range, actually, X265 is slightly better. But now we get to the interesting question, right? So let's say that I'm creating a video on the mount website and I want to encode like a trillion files like this. How long will that actually take? So, oh crap. <laughs> yeah, one, two, three, four. Okay, so um, I'm gonna look a little bit further at this particular point here, which happens to be around like five megabit a second, which you know, has a somewhat high bit rate, but it's okay for you know um, 1080p-ish uh, sequences. Uh, and we're gonna look at speeds, okay? So my target bit rate for all encodes in this step is gonna be like four to 5,000 kbps, and uh, it's actually 4,000. And I'm going to use the preset or CPU used options for X265, X264, and uh, VPXSync to see how does speed 
of my code actually affect quality. So nobody ever looks at this, and, and or nobody ever graphs this out. And I find it very sad because people always say, "Oh, it got faster, or, or slower, or whatever," and it costs some quality, like a bunch of percent. And and that's not a quantifiable metric. So how did it actually change? So this. Um, the reference point that we're looking at for all of them is this point for X264. So X264 here used a very slow preset, 4000 kbps, and that is 0% better than itself. So all of the other basically are interpolated against that line, like close to that point. How much better in quality was it, like interpolated against that point at each of the speed settings? So. The red point here is the, the setting that I used for lib VPX, right? This is CPU zero. And the green point here is what I used for uh, X265, right? So you can see both are about 50% better than X264, but they're more than 10x slower. They're like 20, 25x slower. So that kind of sucks, right? Because I don't want to toast my data center or, or my laptop or whatever. So um, as you go down in speeds, right? So this point is roughly comparable with this in terms of encoding performance uh, in a, as an FPS number, and now suddenly it's only 30% better. That, that, that kind of sucks. 30 is not 50, right? You claimed 50, but it's actually at this, like normalized for CPU usage is only 30% better. Um, so, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm standing in front of the uh, legend. So the red line is libvpx. So X265 actually fares worse, um, I'm sorry to say. So uh, for this particular clip, right, at this particular target bitrate, if you give it a lot of CPU, it will be 50% better. But it drops dramatically very quickly, and actually it even intersects with X264 line here. So what that's telling me is that if my target speed or you know target CPU usage in my data center for this encode, <laughs> oh man, <laughs> if my target CPU usage in my data center is not X264 very slow, but like one of the medium presets, I'm actually better off using X264 than X265. That's not good, right? That's not what was advertised, and, and we shouldn't be happy about that. So um, it would be really cool if instead of just looking at SIM versus uh, bitrate graphs, or you know, piece number of bitrate graphs, if for, you know, next-gen coda comparisons, we could actually start introducing those kind of graphs as well. How much CPU is that actually going to eat? Right? Now, this is difficult. Maybe at the early academic stage, not quite appropriate. But I think at this stage, these are actually interesting questions, because this is the cost that people are going to pay for encoding a billion videos. So if you saw Harold's presentation at ITF 93 on floor, he actually put one of those graphs up. Very cool. Okay, that's that's great. Okay, so I'm happy that some people are doing it. MS, in the MSU draft, they have a similar kind of thing, which is you'll see tomorrow. Yeah. It's slightly different, but it's I think the goal is the same. Um, I just have one question. Yes. Can you go back to the extra sixty-five no, seconds? Uh, this one. Right. Uh, okay, this is quality. Maybe the next one. I think it's about the same. Yeah, they're they're similarish. Why is uh, WPP turned off? Oh, so I, I, I just wanted to know that the CPU usage, assume I, I'm encoding like a billion files, right? So it would definitely be faster if I enable threading, right. but then I'm also using a multiple of cores. So if I encode a trillion or a billion videos or whatever, I don't care if I encode 10 videos on one computer or two videos on one computer with five threads. That's actually the same thing because it might be five times faster, but I need five times as many computers to cover the same amount of files. Do, do, do you see my point? So, uh, so threading helps for the single user case, but for the video on amount case where you encode many, many files, it's not as, as critical. It's still very important, don't get me wrong. But so for this particular test, I wanted to do threading disabled for that reason. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I think it's um, fine to turn off frame threading so mm -hmm. that would um, you know, correlate with what you're saying, but yes. WPP probably not. So we can do additional tests with WPP, right? I mean, those are, those are actually interesting comparisons, right? How does WPP affect quality and speeds, right? So, so, so no, nobody often talks about the actual metrics. They just it got a little bit faster or slower or whatever. Yes, Diego? 
What's WPP? I'm not oh, sorry. WPP is Wavefront Parallel Processing. It's, uh, so uh, uh, she explained that earlier, right? Uh, it's, it's where each row in the HEVC frame is processed by a new thread. So each of them like, like processes independently uh, so that you can do multiple rows in a single frame in multiple, on, on multiple CPU cores. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the entropy context tables are essentially optimized across the wavefront. So you yeah. can share context with like two, two CU offsets and yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, encoding observation. Yes, thank you. Okay, so thank you, Alex. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I just want to say, I just got a Google engineer to touch my laptop every five minutes. <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. Okay, so. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. He's okay, so um, my my uh, so so encoding observations, right? These are very limited tests. This is only one file, blah blah blah. But um, the encoding of these new codecs, right, is fifty percent better. But it's also a lot slower. And if you normalize for that, it, the story is actually not as great. I mean, the VP9 story is still quite good, right? Because it's still on the top left of the X264 graph. So overall, it still works out. The X two six five one actually intersects with the X two six four, and that's not a good thing. And I, you know, I don't think that's necessary. I think a lot of work could be done. You guys are actually doing a lot of work on that, so that's great. So um, hopefully this gets better in the end. So um, you know, overall conclusion for this: did this previous generation next gen video that people talked about three years ago is not actually finished yet? There's a lot of work left to do there, and that's good because you know that's that's work for us. Okay, so let's talk about we have files now, right? So we can actually talk about decoders now. So um, Clement and I set out to write a decoder for VP9, and we basically said that we can do better than them. We can do much better than them, right? So we think that writing a decoder in FFM back, like if we do a really good job, we can be that Formula One card that everybody wants to be. So um, I'm not going to tell you how we wrote it because we write software the same as everyone here does because we're actually all you know multimedia developers, so you guys know what we do because we all do it. So um, the clips that I selected are, the target bit rates are, you know, <coughs> four, four megabits a second for uh, uh, VP9 and HEVC, and a slightly higher uh, target bit rate for 4264. Right, and the reason for that is at that point, they're actually at the same quality, and so then we can do same quality file comparisons to see how well the decoders fare at same file quality. Um, and then we use FFM back to the code, we measure the time and we scale it out. And it looks like this. So um, what, what are we looking at here? So uh, horizontal graph is my which, which codec or which decoder am I using? And vertical graph is FPS, so higher is better. So 264 gets you know, about 110 FPS, right? That's, that's pretty good for this file. And then the funny thing is that PP9 is actually better than 264. Right now, the reason for that is obviously because the bitrate is so much lower. So at this type of bitrate, decoders typically spend most of their time in coefficient decoding. And there's a lot less coefficients, right? Because the file is much smaller. And so as a result, the performance is actually better, even though the coding tools themselves are much more complex. So this is actually great, right? I made my codec more complicated, but it still got faster. Yes, good job. Okay, so. Second thing, let's compare FFVP9 versus LibVPX for the coding purposes. Now, this is a pretty big difference. This is 30-ish percent. So FFVP9, FFmpeg, is 30% faster in decoding the same file than LibVPX. Now, 30% is important, right? So if we're talking about small mobile computers or you know laptops or stuff like that, this directly uh, correlates with battery usage or with heat production. Or the hardware decoders don't care. What? The hardware decoders don't care. Hardware decoders <laughs> don't care, right. But I mean, how many people here have hardware decoding in their laptop, honestly, for VP9? <laughs> and it was silent. See, I told you so. Okay, so um, last thing that I want to talk about is the HEVC. So I'm actually showing two decoders here, right? So this is the HEVC decoder that was integrated in FFmpeg as of like three months ago, two months ago, I think. 
Um, and it's a lot slower even than the VPX, right? So that's not a good sign. So the FFmpeg HVC decoder is actually pretty slow. It kind of sucks, right? So um, the specific reason for that is that the IDCT routines in this decoder are not yet SIMD optimized. So they actually spend a lot of time in C code. That's never a good thing. So um, we added, uh, or I added an extra column here. This is open HVC. That's the same decoder. Open HVC is basically Rockup Merge to FFmpeg to create FFmpeg's HVC decoder except that they use intrinsics, and FFmpeg doesn't use intrinsics, yay, politics, and so that's why there's a C version of an FFmpeg. So this is slightly more representative of the coding performance for such a file if you had a well-optimized decoder, but it's still significantly slower than FFVP9. So um, I think this is a really cool story for VP9. Not only does it compress really well, but it actually decodes really fast also if you use FFmpeg. <laughs> Okay, then uh, last thing, multi-threading, right? How well does, uh, does the decoding scale across uh, multiple threads? Because we all love um, having these nice big BV computers. So um, the blue line is 264, right? So red line is FFVP9. So you can see 264 actually does scale significantly better. Uh, that is expected. Um, there's various technical reasons for that. Um, I can explain more detail if you guys really care. But um, overall, you know, with threading enabled, 264 clearly outperforms FFVP9, but still, those results are not bad, right? I mean, it is a much more complex codec, so maybe we expect that. Um, versus HEVC, scaling is you know, about the same, so that's kind of good. And then libvpx, well, that's a really sad story. What happened there? So um, the file that I created was created with, uh, in the encoder, threading disabled. So, there's these flags in the VP9 bitstream like frame parallelism or tiling, and as a result, those all got turned off. Now, FFmpeg is implemented in such a way that it still uses multi-threading when decoding the file. libvpx, unfortunately, doesn't do that. It only allows for multi-threading when you add particular flags in a bitstream that make it parallelizable in a particular way. And so for the more generalized, um, optimal bitstream usage that was you know, described in academic papers, libvpx doesn't actually implement multi-threading. So libvpx doesn't scale out at all across threads. It scales a little bit from here to here, and that's actually loop filter multi-threading, not general decoding multi-threading. This, this was two and a half, three months ago, so it may be after. Okay, so um, closing remarks for uh, decoding observations. FFmpeg is cool, right? Anyway, so we have a decoder, it's uh, faster than the VPX. Um, at a single thread, it's a little bit faster than 264. With threading, it gets slower. And versus HEVC, well, you know, it's, it's a lot faster. So um, that's a really cool decoder, and I thought it was a really cool project to do. Um, so um, let's just cut it off there for that part. So what do I actually use that for? Um, right, so... This is the kind of stuff that I actually do with decoders. So um, this is a stream analyzer. I wrote that myself. I needed that for something else. And it was actually kind of fun to write. So this is that very clip. This is Tears of Steel encoded in VP9 at a target bit rate of 5,000, apparently. I don't know why it's not the 4,000, but this is the file that I uh, had saved. Um, and this uses FFVP9 as its backend. And so uh, these are the kind of things that I personally do um, when, when I write decoders. I sort of like try to see what's actually going on. And so I, I use this for you know, more encoding-related research work that I like to do in my free time. Right? And you, know, you can see, you can, uh, you can look at transforms, and you can zoom in, and well, you know, that's just awesome. So anyway. Is that public? No, not yet. Does it print on Linux? <laughs> no, it's Mac only. Sorry, I, I don't know anything about Linux UI. So this is this is uh, what's that thing called? Co Coco or Cocoa? Cocoa. Yeah, I think it's I think it's Cocoa based, and I like OpenGL as a graphics backend. So uh, it's pretty Mac specific in terms of like you know the buttons and stuff. But then uh, you know the, the 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 more like deep backend, like the integration of the decoder into the OpenGL pipeline, that's pretty. 
platform independent code. So uh, if somebody likes writing buttons and stuff, like you know, video line developers, you guys are awesome at that. Then you know, I'm sure you guys can do a much better job at that than I can. But so um, I'm not a UI designer. I just you know, I, I love my coding tools for this kind of stuff. So thank you. Um, can I answer any questions? Yeah. Question. <laughs> Go. Well. Uh, does your quality metric include uh, only Luma or Chroma as well? Both. Yeah, both. Right, so this is, this is the typical combination that FFmpeg's tiny SM script gives you. Um, so for 420 subsampled, it's basically 67% Luma and then 17% each for the two Chroma planes. So normalized by you know, pixel density. More questions? Yes? How long did it take uh, to make this test? Which test? Uh, overall. Oh, you mean quality comparisons? Yeah. Uh, so that that's that's hideously slow because you know I uh, so I use the Kerans OBE2 machines actually do the encodes because on my laptop this just never finishes. Um, it, it like in the slowest settings for you know x265 and the VPX it takes like a couple of hours per clip per uh, per point. Uh, it's it's pretty sad, and then when you go to the higher speed settings, it it, it gets better. So it, it takes a few days overall, and then the, the decoder things are like you know a few seconds a piece. Those, those are really quick. De decoders are much faster than encoders, obviously, at the, you know top quality settings. Yes. Do you plan to do any uh, power analysis consumed by the decoding process? Uh, to see uh, so currently, no. I've not looked at power at, at direct power um, usage. Uh, I remember, you know, Google did some work on that earlier, and it typically correlates somewhat well with uh, CPU usage, but, you know, of course it's not exactly one-to-one. -one. So I expect it to be similar, but no, I haven't looked at that myself. I don't think I have the tools for that, honestly. Uh, but that would be interesting to do, yes. Uh, have you tried, uh, have you considered uh, other samples uh, to test, like, say, Big Buck Bunny? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Big Buck Bunny. So, um, uh, when we originally released this, this decoder, uh, we compared it not against X265 and X264, but against X264 and VP8. And the reason for that back then was that um, it was a, a decoder comparison, right? And FFmpeg's HEVC decoder was pathetic, so I didn't want to show that, because you know that would show bad things about FFmpeg, which is not a good thing. So uh, back then, we had, uh, it was VP8 versus VP9 versus X264. Right, and the results between VP9 and X264 were the same, and that was actually over multiple samples. I wrote a blog post about that, so if you Google for FFVP9, it should be like one of the top hits, and you should find multiple samples there. Um, the results are different-ish, so it's not exactly 50% for each sample, but um, the overall quality improvement is pretty consistent. Yes? Well, so what are the tricks that work? Best for this kind of what are the tricks? Yeah, so I, I I tend to think of this as like you know a research code base versus you know like like uh, a, a, a released codec code base, right? So um, we don't care that the code is not half as maintainable as libvpx. So making bitstream changes in this code base would be a lot harder. We make assumptions all over the place that this is how the bitstream spec works, whereas in libvpx, all of that is generalized in nice wrapper functions, which, which may means that if you change something in a bitstream, and for VP10 research purposes, for example, you, you actually only have to change it in a single place. The result of that is um, essentially massive inlining of any sort of variable that we can fix for purposes. That's, that's one big one. So. Um, it, it, it's just much more inlined and hard coded in one way. Uh, the second one is I believe our SIMD is really quite a bit better because LibVPX um, at this point still used intrinsics in most of their places, and we use you know hand coded assembly everywhere, and that typically performs a little bit better. Uh, another big one is uh, the IDCTs. So the, the way that we implemented the IDCTs you can actually do sub-IDCTs on the top left corner of whatever resolution if the block only has a limited number of coded coefficients, and then you only have to do an IDCT on that top left part. That is a huge performance improvement, and the VPX does that only in a very limited way. So, you know, essentially in 264, you used to have, like, DC-only IDCTs, so we basically took that, like, 
three steps further, and, and, and that, that helps a lot. Um, I think those are sort of like the main things. Have you tried overclocking? <laughs> no. <laughs> Ah, as well, yeah. So libvpx, uh, so we did actually, the original blog post, like, uh, you know, my response to Kostya's question earlier, uh, we did include Haswell in that original comparison. So libvpx will work slightly better, but is still quite a bit behind FFM back on Haswell. The reason for that is very simple, right? So I wrote most of the assembly, and this beautiful old laptop of mine has no Haswell, so I don't care about implementing it. So if you want me to implement Haswell assembly, you need to give me a new MacBook Pro that actually has as well, or something like that. I'm not going to write it if I don't have the hardware for it, because what's the point, right? Um, plus, you know, that way I get free new laptops. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, why Sandy Bridge specifically? Uh, again, right, I used Kiran Surfer for some of these things, and Kiran Surfer uh, was, was uh, Sandy Bridge based. I, I haven't put my Haswell in the rack yet. I'll do, I'll do it next week. I love you. So then, then you will have you will have Haswell I'm comparisons. Rack rails. If you can help me find the rack rails, I'll put it in. <laughs> so you see, you see, you have some progress now and things to do, right? Very good. Yeah. So so there, there there's a whole to do list that I didn't show on one of my uh, slides, but uh, it's an open source project, right? So the VP9 I suspect may be finished, but the code surrounding VP9, right? Like the encoder can clearly be improved a lot. So if you looked at the shape of these performance improvements over FPS graphs for the encoders, that looks pretty sad for these next-gen codecs. So that can clearly be improved a lot. And the decoder, same thing. So um, the 10-bit decoder, profile 23 for FFVP9, is not fully synthified yet. Parts have been, like motion compensation, but other parts haven't, like uh, loop filter and uh, an IDCT and interpretation. So, there is a fair to-do list, and then as well, like AVX2 is another item on a to-do list, so that certainly needs to be done. Uh, James Almer has done some work on it, but I don't think it's completed yet. For example, the IDCTs are not yet covered by Haswell functions. So you, de you described a number of optimizations that you did in terms yes. of rewriting things in different parts of the assembly, yes. presumably based on what the likely uh, things are that are expensive. Yes. Can, you talk, can you speak a little bit to the profiling methodology in terms of Am I already using GProf? Like, how are you determining? Oh, Mac I, instruments. What's that? Mac instruments. Okay. Sorry, I'm a Mac user, no, so no, no, all my tools are Mac based. Okay, so, so, um, so you, re you rely on that exclusively for determining, like, you know, where the hotspots are in the code and. Uh, so, so we don't really look much for hotspots. Like, we we basically just for for every line of code that we write, we're sort of like, how can I make this faster? Mm -hmm. And you, you know, so so we we optimize every function. If we think we can make it like a cycle faster, uh, we will do it. Maybe not in header parsing, but like for anything that works inside the block decoding loop, if we can make it one cycle faster, we don't care that it's low in the profiles. We will still make it one cycle faster, just because we can. Okay, thanks. Nice.